Welcome everybody. My name is Mina Jane and I'm the director of the Ashland Public Library in Massachusetts, if you're coming from someplace else. <laughs> and we're really pleased to be here with Janice Nomura, who's gonna be talking about the Doctors Blackwell. <laughs> I just love doing that. Um, so before we get to Janice, I just wanna say a couple things. One is I'm really pleased to be partnering with um, Laura Villamo, who, who is here um, from the Pub uh, Framingham Public Library uh, to bring this program to our communities. And as I always say, when libraries get together, we just can do magic. So this is really special for us. Um, I'd also like to thank the Friends of the Ashland Public Library for supporting all of our adult and all of our programming actually. So um, without them, we could not do any of this. So we appreciate their, um, their support of us. Uh, we are recording this and it is being uh, live streamed on Facebook. So you can put questions in the chat here or people can put questions on Facebook and I'll um, moderate those questions to Janice at the end. So if you put your questions in chat, I will moderate them as, we, as she finishes her presentation. Um, you can also unmute yourself and ask your question directly at that, at that time. So um, I'm just gonna do a quick introduction for Janice because she has some really interesting things to tell us. And one of the things that I thought was super interesting um, in Dennis's bio is that she knew when she was younger that she was never going to be a historian. She told that to her college guidance counselor in 1988, uh, aging you a little bit. Um, she thought she wanted to be a doctor, but here she is as a historian. So I'd love to know more about that. And I also think it's kind of interesting that you wanted to be a doctor and you wrote this book. So um, please tell us all about yourself and the doctors Blackwell. My pleasure. Thanks so much for having me and to all of you for joining us tonight. Um, library audiences are the best audiences. I'm going to share my screen, get some pictures going. There we go. All right. So the doctor's Blackwell. Um, if you, you probably, you may be familiar with the name Elizabeth Blackwell. If you are, it's usually followed in your head by the phrase, first woman doctor. She was the first woman in this country to receive a medical degree in 1849. Uh, her sister Emily followed her to become the third woman in America um, to receive a medical degree in 1854. And together they founded the New York Infirmary for Indigent Women and Children, and then the Women's Medical College of the New York Infirmary. So I encountered the Blackwell story for the first time six years ago six years ago, seven years ago now, maybe. Um, we're, in, we're in 2022, when did that happen? Um, uh, I was a little stunned that I had never heard of them. I was born and raised in New York where I still live. That's where they practiced. I had gone to a proudly feminist all girls school since the age of five. Um, I was the math science kid there. I graduated, as you heard, with the intention of pursuing medicine, though I was later seduced by the humanities. Um, how had I never heard of them? How had I never heard of them? Um, so I went looking for them and I discovered that they're not hard to find, or at least Elizabeth is not hard to find on the children's biography shelf. And Mina and I were just chatting about this. Um, on the children's biography shelf, there are many versions of this Elizabeth Blackwell first woman doctor story. This is a chapter book from the 1940s. Um, they have much in common with each other. They all feature illustrations of slim, attractive young women with stethoscopes bending solicitously over grateful patients. Um, very few of them spend much time on Emily at all. Um, so this is from the 40s. Here's the modern middle grade version. Same nice clothes, stethoscope, grateful patient. Here's a picture book version with a younger, perkier Elizabeth with cute red hair ties. Um, but there's the stethoscope in the bag waiting for her to grow up. Um, it's always just Elizabeth, never Emily. Um, the fact is that the Blackwells looked like this. And in the 1840s, when they were as young as the women pictured in all those picture books, even stethoscopes looked like this. So it was clear that there was a lot that was being um, sanitized, simplified in those children's versions. There was nothing wrong with them per se, but they left a tremendous amount out. And I discovered this as I began to pursue Elizabeth and Emily into the archives, listening to their letters and their journals, their voices in their own writing. And the women that 
emerged from those those personal writings were complicated. They were uh, prickly. They were sometimes contradictory. They didn't always behave the way you expect feminist icons to behave. Um, and as I read, I became more and more eager to tell their whole story um, with all its ragged edges and all its contradictions. Um, the whole story, not just what fits in a picture book. So what is that story, briefly? Um, the eight out of the nine Blackwell siblings were born in Bristol, England. They came to this country as children in 1832. They were the sons and daughters of a man who was something of a paradox. Samuel Blackwell had made his money in the sugar industry. Bristol was a sugar capital, um, sugar industry based in Caribbean plantations. Uh, he spent most of his free time as an ardent abolitionist. So there's a contradiction there, if you think about it for a minute. Um, he was an unorthodox thinker who wanted to make the world a better place. Um, he gave his five daughters the same education as his four sons, also very unusual. And he moved them from Bristol all the way to the new world on the strength of a dream, the dream of making sugar from sugar beets that could be grown in the North without enslaved labor rather than sugar cane that was grown in uh, tropical plantations with enslaved labor. Uh, he moved them first to New York and then by 1838, all the way out to the edge of the known universe at that point, which was Cincinnati. Um, he got them all, now nine of them, because George Washington Blackwell had been born in New York. Um, the nine children, got them all the way out to Cincinnati in 1838, and then he died um, and left them with almost nothing uh, on the edge of civilization. His final lesson being that a husband is no guarantee of security. None of his five daughters ever married. Um, and here at this point, the Blackwells really become a tribe. They become this, this clan of nine siblings that are more tightly bonded to each other than to anyone else in the world. Um, and that becomes a great gift to their biographer because um, as, cl to as closely bonded siblings often do, they sort of drive each other nuts and they're always leaving and writing to each other. Um, a huge trove of letters between and among siblings, giving the biographer a great wealth of multiple perspectives on every moment of the story. Um, just to give you a little sense of what it looks like to do Victorian archival research um, in the earlier parts of the 19th century when paper and postage were both very expensive, uh, you did something called cross writing, which is you filled the page um, from top to bottom and then you turned it 90 degrees and you filled it again right on top. Sometimes you flipped it over and did the same thing on the back. Um, I happen to kind of dig this kind of decoding. Uh, it's actually not that hard to read. This is a letter from uh, Elizabeth's younger brother, Henry to Elizabeth. He has beautiful handwriting, um, but it, I know it's not to everyone's taste. Here's a close up. Um, you can kind of zone in and it, it becomes clear. Anyway, um, Elizabeth was born in 1821 she was voraciously brilliant, socially quite awkward, uh, and blessed with a healthy sense of her own self-worth. She was a, a huge reader. Um, she was a fan of a woman who was a bestseller at the moment when Elizabeth was coming of age. Margaret Fuller had published a best-selling book in the 1840s called Woman in the, Woman in the 19th Century. Um, and that book would have been part of the Blackwell's library. Elizabeth would have read it. And that book argued that humanity was not going to rise to a new level of enlightenment until women unleashed their own power and claimed their independence. Um, Margaret Fuller argued that women could be anything men could be. It was not a matter of sex. It was a matter of talent and effort. Women could be sea captains, said Margaret Fuller. Um, and Elizabeth, on reading this, that really resonated with her. She began to see herself as someone whose life could prove Margaret Fuller's point and whose example could be a beacon for womankind. I told you she had a healthy ego. Um, she wasn't shy about this kind of thing. So Elizabeth Blackwell chose medicine as the way she was gonna make that point. It was an unusual choice. Um, she didn't choose it because she liked science. She didn't choose it because she liked taking care of people. She didn't really like people all that much. Um, 
She chose it because medicine was an unusually clear way to make a point. In the mid 1840s, medicine was redefining itself, both institutionally and scientifically. Um, to this point, it had been considered more of a trade, the trade of midwives and barber surgeons. Um, increasingly now, it was a profession, a profession uh, of men who were legitimate by virtue of having gone to a medical school and received a medical degree. Um, so Elizabeth thought, if I can find my way into a, a medical school, and attend all the lectures and pass all the examinations and receive a diploma, who can argue that I am not as qualified as any man to be a doctor? Um, and in the mid 1840s, um, medical school was not the overwhelming challenge that it is today. Uh, medicine was what you did if you weren't smart enough to go into the law or the ministry. Um, medical school, as this cartoon sort of alludes to, was consisted of two identical 16 week terms of lectures. If you were really lucky, you got to do a little bit of dissecting, but you really didn't interact with live patients. Um, those two terms repeated each other in the middle, in the summer in between them, you might go and get some practical experience, but it was possible to graduate from medical school without ever having touched a living patient. Um, Elizabeth, you know, who was quite brilliant, um, was quite confident that if she could find her way into a medical school, she was going to have very little trouble finding her way through. So um, finding her way into a medical school, right? Um, this was harder than it sounded. Um, because in the 1840s, the very idea of a woman wanting to pursue medicine was outrageous. It's hard to overstate how outrageous that sounded to most people, not just because doctoring was outside of the professions that were appropriate for women. You know, a woman who worked might teach. She might she might be a nurse, although that was a little déclassé. She might write. Um, but it wasn't within woman's sphere to aspire to be a doctor. Um, not to mention, a woman who wanted to go to medical school was essentially saying that she wanted to sit in a room full of men examining the intimate details of the human body. What lady would want that? Uh, it was appalling. And the um, physicians and the medical schools that Elizabeth brought her question of admission to mostly laughed in her face or refused to talk to her at all. Um, she amassed a sheaf of rejections. Finally, in uh, at about the time she was about 26, she received a letter of uh, acceptance from a tiny rural medical school in Geneva, New York, Geneva Medical College at the tip of Seneca Lake in the Finger Lakes region. Uh, on the left, the medical building as it would have looked when she was there, and on the right, the spot where it once stood today. Um, Geneva Medical College has, Geneva College has evolved into Hobart and William Smith Colleges. And in fact, the, the campus looks a lot like it did in the 1840s, which it was um, wonderfully exciting to do research at. Um, the story of her admission is different depending on where you look. If you read Elizabeth Blackwell's memoir, which was written 50 years later, um, it sounds sort of like, at last, after much struggle, uh, a letter of, rec of acceptance arrived, I bought a train ticket to Geneva, and off I went, never having doubted my possibility of success. Um, the real story, which interestingly is included in that same memoir as an appendix, was told by one of her Geneva College classmates, a man named Stephen Smith, who went on to be a very prominent New York City physician. Stephen Smith's story, tucked in the back of the memoir, is that um, a letter arrived at Geneva College from a prominent Philadelphia physician who recommended Elizabeth Blackwell. He was mentoring her, he was uh, allowing her to observe his practice, and he had sent a letter to Geneva College suggesting that they admit her. Uh, and the faculty of Geneva College, again, a provincial, rather low, uh, low on the totem pole med school, um, the faculty weren't quite bold enough to reject this prominent Philadelphia physician out of hand. So they punted and they went to the students. They brought this letter of recommendation to the students and they said, OK, students, a boisterous group of provincial boys, mind you, um, you shall vote on whether this woman joins us. If any one of you rejects the idea that she should join us, then she won't come. And the faculty figured they would be safe. The students 
recognizing that the faculty were being a little bit less than bold, um, and also that this was a great opportunity for mischief, uh, called a meeting, basically bludgeoned into submission anyone who said that they didn't want a woman among them, and returned a boisterous yes to the faculty the next day, um, assuming that this was a practical joke being played by a rival medical school until three weeks later when Elizabeth Blackwell walked into the lecture hall and sat down. Um, once admitted, she quickly rose to the top of her class. Uh, she had more than enough intellectual firepower to succeed in Geneva Medical College, and she earned the respects of both the, her fellow students and the faculty because she was working at a level of determination that none of them could match. Um, between medical school terms in the summer of 1848, she went back to Philadelphia to see if she could get some practical experience. Um, at what was then the largest municipal hospital in America, Blockley Alms House in Philadelphia. Now, sidebar here, in the 1840s, hospital did not mean what we think of today when we hear hospital. Hospital was not a place where you went to get better. A hospital was a place where you went where you had, when you had nowhere else to go. Um, people with any means at all would have a doctor come to their home. Um, if you went to a hospital, it meant that you were at the end of the line. Um, Elizabeth found her way to a room for the summer off the female syphilis ward, where from having no practical experience with patients, she suddenly had more than she could handle. Um, that was a, a miserable ward. Um, she also uh, had a sudden and vast exposure to epidemic disease. This was the summer of 1848 and waves of refugees were arriving from continental Europe and from Ireland, carrying what was then called ship fever, what we now call typhus. Um, Elizabeth ended up writing her thesis on ship fever for Geneva College. Um, I think rather pointedly picking a non-gynecological topic, a non-gendered topic. Um, she made connections here. She began to make connections at Blockley between um, poverty and public health between venereal disease and the plight of women. Uh, these were important ideas that really started to frame and shape her path forward in medicine. Uh, she returned to Geneva College where she graduated at the top of her class and that thesis that she wrote on ship fever, ship fever was published as the lead article in the Buffalo Medical Journal to coincide with her graduation in the winter of 1849. Again, she did not just make her way through medical school, she blazed a shining path. Um, so then she's got her degree, it's 1849, and she definitely needs more practical experience. So she does what many American medical graduates did back then. Uh, she goes to Europe to get some polish, some, some further training at the top of the game. The real capitals of medical education were in Europe. Uh, and the, 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 the one that was above them all was Paris. So Elizabeth goes to Paris where the state-sponsored medical education is free. Uh, there's an, an enormous emphasis on practical education at the bedside. This is gonna be great. And then she gets there and discovers that, that none of it is accessible to her because she refuses to disguise herself as a man. The whole point of this project that she has launched herself on is that she is going to prove that a woman can be anything a man can be. Doing it in drag is not going to help her prove that point what to do. She finds her way here to La Maternité, a municipal obstetric hospital, maternity hospital, in, uh, in an old convent, which is still there in Paris. I got to explore it and take this picture. Um, La Maternité was an interesting place. It was a training hospital for young women from all over France to learn how to be mid midwives. And they would come, young, young girls really, live in dormitories and um, treat the parade of destitute women who came here to deliver children. Um, again, if you were delivering a baby in a hospital, it meant that you had nowhere else to deliver a baby because most people deliver it at home. So again, this was a pretty intense place. Um, Elizabeth already had a medical degree and she was considerably older than the students at La Maternité, but she knew that if she came here, she would have exposure to a volume of cases that she wouldn't be able to have access to anywhere else. So she did that. She went and lived in a dormitory with all of these giggling girls that she uh, didn't have a whole lot of respect for, but she did learn a tremendous amount and continued to make connections about public health and poverty. Um, 
it was here that she underwent a crisis that changed the shape of her career, if, if not its direction. Um, I mentioned that uh, women delivering here would have been sort of at the end of the line. Many of them were prostitutes. Many of them were infected with venereal disease. Um, a, a baby who passes through the birth canal of a woman infected with gonorrhea can contract an eye infection called gonorrheal conjunctivitis. And Elizabeth was tending to one of these infants early one morning when some of the washing liquid she was using to um, clean the affected infant's eyes um, splashed into her own face and she contracted gonorrheal conjunctivitis. Um, and in 1849, that was a crisis. He, today, this would be something that could be treated with antibiotics, but those didn't exist then. So suddenly she found herself confined to a bed in the hospital where she had been working. And for weeks she lay there with the fate of her vision hanging in the balance. Um, and this is a, another good moment to pause and, and show you what, what I do as somebody reading various accounts of one moment and then braiding them together into a story. Um, her colleague, um, the attending physician, the wonderfully named Dr. Hippolyte Bleu, um, who had been her, her, her colleague until now, teaching her a great deal, suddenly became her physician. Um, and again, in her memoir written 50 years later, this is how she described those initial days of, of medical crisis. Ah, how dreadful it was to find the daylight gradually fading as my kind doctor bent over me and removed with an exquisite delicacy of touch the films that had formed over the pupil. I could see him for a moment clearly, but the sight soon vanished and the eye was left in darkness. It sounds kind of like a romance novel, right? And of course, Dr. Blow could be a leading man. Um, fortunately for Elizabeth, her eldest sister, Anna Blackwell, happened to be in Paris at the same time. Um, and as this, so Anna Blackwell was a, a journalist by trade. Um, she was something of a hypochondriac. And as this photo, I think, wonderfully suggests, she was something of a drama queen. Um, she rushed to Elizabeth's bedside and spent the days trying to help take care of her. Uh, and the evenings writing long journalistic letters back to the folks in Cincinnati um, with great gusto. Um, this is the kind of thing Anna wrote to them about what was happening to Elizabeth. The pupil presents just now the appearance of one of those little misshapen blackberries of three granulations and half dried up that one sees so often on some scrubby little bush. If you can fancy one such in dull looking lead, you have just the appearance of this poor eye. Uh, a very different account. Um, uh, Elizabeth eventually lost one eye and was fitted for a glass prosthetic, which she wore for the rest of her life. If you squint at this portrait, um, you can see a very slight asymmetry in her gaze. Um, many people never knew that she only had one eye. She didn't talk about it, um, but it did alter what her future was going to look like. Surgery was no longer an option for her. Um, reading even could be tiring and painful with the eye that remained to her. Um, so it pushed her in a direction that I think she was already headed, which was toward public health, toward thinking and talking and writing and lecturing about medicine and hygiene, um, rather than actually practicing on patients. Uh, at this point, she has, does she go back to Cincinnati to get used to her glass eye and recover? No, she goes on to London to continue her training. Um, indomitable, uh, really, I'm, I'm perpetually in awe of the strength of Elizabeth Blackwell in this moment, having just lost an eye. Um, she goes on to London where she trains at St. Bartholomew's Hospital and she makes a fateful acquaintance. Mutual friends introduce her to a young woman named Florence Nightingale, who in 1851, 50, 50, 51, when, when, this is, when this convergence happens, is not the global celebrity, the lady with the lamp, the hero of the Crimean War. Um, she is a young woman from a wealthy family who really want her to settle down and get married. And she is chafing against that because she really wants to make a life in public health. And um, I like to think that her encounter with Elizabeth Blackwell in this moment in her life is something of a catalyst. Here is Elizabeth Blackwell, a 27, eight-year-old woman, 
um, who has left marriage and family behind in America, has received a medical degree, is roaming all over Europe getting medical experience, Elizabeth Blackwell is proof that the kind of life Florence Nightingale dreams about might be possible. Uh, and they have this instant ecstatic friendship where they walk for hours together talking about hospital management and hygiene and ideas about public health. And they also fairly swiftly come upon a basic contradiction between them, which is that Florence Nightingale believes that the role of women is as nurses. And Elizabeth Blackwell has staked her life on the idea that a woman can be a doctor. So that remains a tension between them. Although they never lose touch with each other, they never really align with each other either. Um, okay, so now Elizabeth has her training in Europe and it's time to go back to America and start a practice, which she assumes will be instantly successful because what woman wouldn't want to consult a female physician about the embarrassing intimate details of what's wrong with her? Women have died because they would rather not disclose their symptoms to a male doctor, surely there will be a huge patient base for Elizabeth. Um, she goes to New York where she decides to start, start her practice and no one comes. Why not? Well, in 1852 now, um, the very phrase female physician is a problem. A female physician is not what, when, when people hear that phrase, they don't think, oh, bright young woman with a medical degree. They think of someone like this woman, Madame Rastel, the notorious Fifth Avenue abortionist, um, pictured here in a caricature in the National Police Gazette as a baby-eating demon. Um, a, a female physician is someone who operates in the shadows, on the wrong side of the law. Um, nice women don't consult female physicians, at least not explicitly in, in, in broad daylight. Um, this is a problem. Elizabeth finds herself becalmed and dismayed and um, what, what's going to happen next? Meanwhile, she has anointed her sister Emily, five years younger, to follow her into medicine. She knows that medicine is going to be a steep and lonely path. She thinks of her siblings as, um, as more interesting and, and, um, and accomplished than anyone else in the world. So she chooses her next youngest and most brilliant sister, um, and I think Emily was, first of all, more naturally attracted to the natural sciences. And second, was probably quite accustomed to doing what her three older sisters told her to do. So when Elizabeth sort of anointed her to follow her, she said, OK, I'll take up that challenge. Um, you would think that being the second Blackwell sister to seek admission to a medical school, she would have had an easier time. But you would be wrong. Um, partly, ironically, due to Elizabeth's success, the medical schools had shut their doors even more firmly against women. Um, it was clear that a woman could succeed, and if that was true, they didn't want any more women around. Um, to complicate matters further, in the years since Elizabeth had received her degree, a couple of female medical colleges had opened in Boston and in Philadelphia. Um, the men could say, why do you need to come here? Go to one of those female colleges, that's for you. Um, Emily and Elizabeth thought of these female colleges as decidedly mediocre. Emily did not want to get a degree that was any less prestigious than the one her sister had, had earned. There was some competition between them, although it was a little bit um, uh, low key. Um, so Emily persevered and eventually found her way to Rush College in Chicago, where she had a wonderful first year of medical school upon at, at which point the trustees of Rush got cold feet and asked her not to return. Um, undaunted, she pivoted to Cleveland Medical College, which has since evolved into Case Western, and she finished her degree there. Then she too needed to go to Europe to get some polish and some experience. And I think she also rather pointedly chose the one capital of European medical education that Elizabeth hadn't studied in, which was Edinburgh. Um, she attached herself to the practice of James Young Simpson, um, who at the moment, at this moment, was one of the most prominent physicians in Britain. He was the obstetrics and gynecology professor at the University of Edinburgh. He had an appointment to the Queen. Uh, he had a very well-heeled clientele. Um, he was something of a showman. He was the man who uh, had discovered the anesthetic properties of chloroform in 1847. Um, the story went that he discovered the properties of chloroform by passing a decanter of chloroform around at his dinner table, whereupon all of his dinner guests burst into hysterical laughter and then passed out under the table. Um, 
a showman, I, I think he probably enjoyed the shock value of having a woman among his assistants. Um, he liked to call into the next room, Dr. Blackwell, come here. And then everybody would gasp when a woman walked into the room. At the same time, he was a very accomplished physician. He respected her abilities and he taught her a great deal, including the use of the, the, the tools of his trade. Um, the, a, a pessary that would have been used in cases of uterine prolapse to keep internal organs in place. Um, a, an instrument that he had invented, a uterine sound that was sort of a, a graduated probe to measure the dimensions of the cervix. Um, he was a, a pioneer of the pelvic exam, something that Emily was initially quite startled by, but she grew to understand and respect the diagnostic power of that. Um, and so she's learning uh, at the top of the game while her sister Elizabeth is um, twiddling her thumbs in New York. And Emily is writing all of this to Elizabeth. She suddenly become the teacher. Um, you can see those two instruments sketched in the margin of this letter from Emily to Elizabeth in New York. Um, from the beginning, it was really important to me that this be a double portrait, um, a biography of two sisters, not just Elizabeth. Um, but the material is somewhat lopsided. There is more material about Elizabeth. She wrote more, more was written about her, more of her papers were preserved because of her fame as the first woman doctor. So what do you do when you want to make a double biography? and? The materials lopsided. One of the things you can do is my favorite thing to do, which is get out of the archive and start going and doing what going to and doing what your subjects did. So I gathered up Emily's Edinburgh letters and, and went to Edinburgh and basically followed her around and did everything she did to set it to get a, a deeper sense of what her life was like at that time. Um, for instance, I went to 52 Queen Street, which was Simpson's home, still there the only house in the row with an extra story because his practice and his family and his social life were bursting at the seams. Um, she would have come here every day, um, gone up to the second floor and worked in his consulting rooms. Um, the day I went by to take the picture, the door was open. So in the spirit of um, following in the footsteps, I walked in. Um, it's, it's currently a, a drug counseling center, so I wasn't technically trespassing on private property, but I got to look around a little bit before they asked me to walk out again um, and got to see details like James Young Simpson's Latinized initials worked into the banister um, that Emily would have climbed every every morning. Um, that both gives you a sense of what she saw on her way to work and what he was like, because what kind of guy puts his initials in his own banister? Um, I also had a chance to go to the wonderful History of Medicine Museum at the Royal College of Surgeons, where they wouldn't let me take pictures, but I had my notebook. And they had a huge vitrine full of Simpson artifacts, including on the left in the middle, his pocket pill case that said, please return to 52 Queen Street under the lid, but he would take on house calls that had compartments for things like mercury and opium. Um, down there on the left in the corner are his two of his monaural stethoscopes in ivory and rosewood. I wanted to believe that maybe Emily had used one of those when he when she was working in his consulting rooms. They even had the decanter for the for the chloroform. Um, so Emily is 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 really learning to be a physician in Edinburgh with Dr. Simpson. Um, it's not enough, of course, to protect her from the kind of media snarkiness that Elizabeth had come in for as well when she first started out. This is a caricature from the London satiric newspaper Punch from 1856, um, meant to depict Emily there on the right in the outrageous bloomer costume of the women's rights advocates, which she was not, interestingly. Um, but there's Emily in a ridiculous hat and spectacles and the rather mannish profile peering at the only patient who would consult a female physician, and that would be a lap dog, um, being clutched in the arms of a much more conventionally feminine maiden. Fortunately, both Elizabeth and Emily were very good at ignoring this kind of thing. And then Emily has finished her European training, and finally she comes back to New York and joins Elizabeth so that they can join forces at last. And together in 1857, they found the New York Infirmary for indigent women and children in a building that still stands on the corner of Crosby and Bleecker Streets in Greenwich Village, if you're familiar with Manhattan, um, on the left as it once looked and on the right as it looks now. Um, this was the first hospital staffed entirely by women. And it's 
purpose was twofold. One, to provide free medical care to the women of the tenement neighborhoods um, by women doctors, and also to provide a place for the slowly growing numbers of female medical graduates to have a place to train so they wouldn't have to go to Europe the way Elizabeth and Emily had. Um, I was lucky enough to become friendly with the woman who makes this building her headquarters now. Um, she is passionately interested in the legacy of the building and the Blackwell story. And she was restoring the building when I met her. So I was able to actually write the um, chapter about the infirmary in the infirmary and see as she renovated it, some of its original details, the brickwork, the rafters, the giant sash windows, and really get a sense of what this space would have felt like when it was a very small hospital in 1857. Um, as you might expect for two women who founded a hospital, uh, in 1857, the Blackwells had a role to play in the Civil War. Um, when the first shots rang out in 1861, they called a meeting in their own living room of their donors and supporters and drafted this appeal uh, for the New York Times, an appeal to the women of New York and especially to those already engaged in preparing against the time of wounds and sickness in the army. Um, there was a lot of chaotic energy in New York um, directed at the Union cause, but nobody really knew how to channel it. Um, in response to this appeal, thousands of women gathered at, in the Great Hall of Cooper Union, another building that still stands downtown. And out of this gathering was born an organization called the Women's, so the Women's Central Association of Relief, um, which eventually evolved into the U.S. Sanitary Commission. Um, so you can draw a straight line, more or less, from the Blackwell's living room to the most important civilian organization of the Civil War. Um, the Blackwell sisters found themselves at the head of the committee charged with um, selecting and training young women to serve as nurses at the front, and they threw themselves into this work with great enthusiasm. This this felt like like the fruition of the Margaret Fuller idea, right? Men and women standing shoulder to shoulder in the service of a great cause, doing important work together. Um, but their excitement and pride quickly shifted toward dismay. They spent a year doing this work of training nurses, but they discovered that New York's male physicians weren't quite ready to stand shoulder to shoulder with female physicians. Um, they left the Blackwell's infirmary off the list of, ho list of hospitals that would be um, training the young women to be nurses. Um, they selected as the leader in Washington, uh, Dorothea Dix, who had no medical training. Um, she was a lobbyist and an organizer, but not a medical person. Elizabeth called her the meddler in chief. There was no love lost there. Um, and Elizabeth and Emily eventually withdrew their support from the war effort um, because they were frustrated. Uh, and they turned their attention to their um, largest and final collaborative project together, which was the foundation of a women's medical college attached to their infirmary. Now, this was an interesting move. They had always maintained that women and men should study medical, st study medicine together. They didn't believe in separate, in, in separating the sexes educationally. Um, they thought that their example of success at the men's medical colleges would have opened those colleges to more women, but that's not what happened. Instead, more women's medical colleges began to open. Um, it, it was still just as hard for women to find their way into the men's colleges, and the women's colleges were inferior. Um, they, they knew this because the graduates of those medical women's medical colleges were arriving at the New York Infirmary to train with the Blackwell sisters, and they weren't very well trained. Um, so the Blackwells decided, okay, we will change our minds. We will open our own women's medical college until such time as the men come, come to their senses. And our medical college will be even more rigorous than the programs we ourselves attended. So they instituted some real progressive innovation in medical education. Their women's medical college, which opened in 1869, was three years instead of two. It was a progressive cu curriculum that built on itself instead of repeating itself. And they had practical instruction at the bedside because it was a college that was attached to a hospital. Um, these were all major innovations that would become part of mainstream medical education later on. Um, this, so this, this was sort of the arc of their professional lives. Personally, their lives were just as interesting. Um, 
both sisters adopted daughters, interestingly. Um, Emily lived with uh, her female partner and fellow surgeon, Elizabeth Cushier, from the, for the last several decades of her life. Um, two of their brothers married two of the most prominent feminists of the day, uh, Lucy Stone, the suffrage activist, and Antoinette Brown, who was the first woman in this country to be uh, ordained as a minister. Uh, I like to think of Henry and Sam as the first feminist husbands. Uh, to complicate the story further, Elizabeth and Emily were not always in sisterhood with these, um, these progressive sisters-in-law of theirs. Um, Elizabeth and Emily weren't always aligned with the women's rights movement. Uh, it, it complicates the story and in, in my, from my perspective makes it more interesting, I think. Um, Elizabeth and Emily didn't really think that suffrage should be the first goal of, for women. And they didn't always have a very high um, respect for women in general. Um, and then complicating the story even more, they didn't always agree with each other on what the role of a woman in medicine should be. Um, even though they had built this infirmary and college together, they disagreed. So Elizabeth thought, came to think really, that a woman in medicine, a woman doctor, should be more of a teacher armed with science. She gravitated more and more toward public health, toward moral reform, toward lecturing and writing rather than actually practicing and seeing patients. Emily thought that a woman doctor should just be as excellent a surgeon and medical professor and obstetrician and practitioner as any man. And that's what she wanted to do. So almost as soon as the college was founded, they parted ways uh, with some relief and spent the last several decades of their lives on different continents. Elizabeth went back to England and pursued these public health and moral reform initiatives that she was interested in. Emily stayed in New York and ran the college and the infirmary very successfully for the rest of her career. In, in some ways, um, sustaining her sister's legacy at the expense of her own, because we've heard of Elizabeth today and very few of us have heard of Emily. Um, so that's the outline of the story. And this, this moment, this <laughs> intense public health and female leadership moment that, we've, that we're undergoing in our, in, our, in our world right now, feels like a good time for the Blackwell story. I like to end with this photograph. Um, which tells a little story of its own. If you um, get online and Google Elizabeth Blackwell and go to images, you will always see this photo. I've seen it attached to articles about the Blackwells, websites, uh, documentary films. I've seen it on the cover of at least one biography. Um, it's a beautiful image of a woman who seems to be gazing into a progressive future. Um, this is not a picture of Elizabeth Blackwell. How do I know? Well, it's in the Museum of the City of New York. And if you flip it over, you can see that it was taken at Dana's Photo Portrait Gallery on 14th Street and 6th Avenue, an, an, uh, an establishment that did not exist until the mid 1880s when Elizabeth Blackwell was in her mid 60s. And no matter how well preserved, this is not a woman in her mid 60s. Um, why does this misattribution persist? Well, I think it's largely because this is how we like our heroines to look. If you are looking for a picture of Elizabeth Blackwell and you go online and Google it, and this is one of your choices as opposed to this, you go for the, the pretty, perky, elegant young woman. Um, we sometimes, not sometimes, almost always um, want our heroines to be lovely. Um, we want them to be adorable. We want them to be likable. Um, and Elizabeth and Emily Blackwell weren't always that. Uh, they were not perky or pretty. They were not interested in pleasing anyone. They were complicated and prickly and imperfect and very real heroines, and they changed the world. And I think it's important to remember that you don't have to be a Disney princess to do that. Um, thank you for listening, and I'd love to take some questions if there are any. Okay, I'm coming back. <laughs> Um, one second. Great. Okay, I'm back. So, um, so I'm going to go back to like the very beginning before we started talking about the Blackwells, because, um, you know, I had mentioned that you had said in your bio that you didn't want to be a historian. So I'm wondering what changed for you. And, um, you know, what has been the most interesting thing about being a historian or maybe most the most challenging? Um, what changed is that I went to college and discovered that the English classes were just much more fun than the biology classes. Um, 
And I guess I didn't have a lot of mentors around saying stick to it. Um, so I didn't. Um, this coming around to this subject was kind of a, 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 an interesting full circle. Um, it was a chance to explore some of these ideas uh, without having taken that path. Um, I would correct you. I'm not, I, I wouldn't call myself a historian. I don't have a degree in history. I have a master's degree, but I don't have a doctorate or anything like that. I'm not a, a trained historian. Um, my goal is to write deeply re researched history for people who don't think they like to read history. Um, I, I am happiest when someone says, wow, it, it felt like a novel. Um, it took me until college to, to and, and and one very very brilliant professor to realize that history is is just made of stories about people that that's all history is it's stories about people um i didn't know that growing up i hated studying history because it 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 felt like um it was all about five paragraph essays about social political and economic trends um once i learned that it was about storytelling um, I really wanted to tell those stories. And there's something very exciting about finding treasure in archives and reading 19th century letters, letters where you can see the hand of, of a person who has been gone a long time. Mm -hmm. um, so I see that Herb, Herb has his ha uh, hand up, yes. though. Yes. Uh, I just want to thank uh, Janice. It was just fantastic. Oh, You're thank you. I, unbelievable, really gripping, uh, educational. I, I, I can't get over it. It was just a wonderful presentation. And uh, Thank you my so wife much. and I have seen a lot of Zoom uh, things. A lot of them are boring. This was not, this was really fantastic. Very good. Yes. Thank you so much. Okay. <laughs> um, Herb, did you guys have a question as well? Or because that's, more than enough and plenty and awesome, but it's yeah, enough no, it was just a little feedback. I yeah. just I couldn't get over it. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you. I really appreciate that. It means a lot to me. Okay. Okay. Thanks. So I should say that if I see, you can raise your hand or if you unmute yourself, I will see that you're unmuted and you can um, ask Janice a question. And please feel free to put questions in the chat. I'll be asking those as well if you'd like for me to. So. Um, what about the Blackwells really intrigued you to write about them? Because there is so much about them. Well, at least Elizabeth. Well, they people say that if 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 you're if you're if you're interested in writing a biography, um, the first thing to ask yourself is, am I drowning in material? Because if you're not drowning in material, you probably don't have enough. Um, you know, distilling a, a, a good story that people want to read out of archival material requires a great deal of, of raw material. And the Blackwells um, were really that, a very rare um, situation where you have, you know, these women who accomplished ast astonishing things um, in a family of people who, was, who accomplished astonishing things, an incredibly literate family that wrote constantly wrote all the time, wrote journals, wrote letters to each other. And so much of it was preserved. And I was very lucky because the, the one of the largest deposits of Blackwell papers is at the Schlesinger Library at Radcliffe. Um, and just before I got interested in the Blackwells, they had just finished digitizing their entire collection of thousands of letters. So that was something that made this possible in a way that it might not have been if I had you know, gotten interested 10 years earlier. Mm -hmm. um, that that ability to uh, investigate the story from multiple perspectives, you know, Elizabeth's graduation. What did her siblings think? I have I have, I have several voices speaking, you know, intimately about how they felt about that. Um, that that's a very rare, precious thing to be able to work with. Wow, I actually was really interested in your um, your tour that followed Emily's, um, you know, her her tour, I would say, or, or her learning um, arc, because I think that, you know, like when you travel, you do feel like you can you feel the history there. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm a big believer in in getting close to the ghosts. Um, I, you know, I went to Paris and climbed around that convent. I um, went to Geneva, New York, and which, you know, where where the, the main drag is really very much like it was in the 1850s. Um, went to London, went to Bristol. 
in Edinburgh. I mean, it was a great gift. I, I didn't really know at the beginning of, of, of this project that I would have all this great travel in it, but it, um, it turned into a really, a really precious part of the work. Mm -hmm. And I, I was also glad to hear that you said that uh, about digitizing from the library, because libraries, you know, especially during COVID became really the repositories for a lot of authors. Um, I, I will I will say something interesting for people who, who might be intrigued by this. The Library of Congress is the other place where a lot of Blackwell material is held, and they have a crowdsourced transcription project going on the Blackwell material, where if mm -hmm. you raise your hand, they will send you letters to transcribe, and you will become part of the initiative, the effort to transcribe letters and make it more accessible for researchers in the future. So if you're interested in being part of that project, it's, you can just go to their website and sign up. Um, I'm going to do that after this program. <laughs> um, Anne asks, do you have another subject in mind? I'm groping toward that. I wish I could tell you exactly what I was about to do next, but I, that would require me to know, and I don't really. <laughs> 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 because this came out in 2020, you said. 2021, a year ago. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and Christine says, I love seeing the book covers as I recognize the one I read in the 50s or 60s on Elizabeth, which I also recognize one of them. My father graduated from Tufts Medical School in 1955, and I even remember as a child looking at his yearbook and seeing only one or two women being and being struck by that. What kept women from not going to medical school or not being accepted even 100 years later after Elizabeth Blackwell? Was it society, money? Um, well, it was, you know, social norms for sure. Um, part of the problem was that, uh, this is getting a little bit into the weeds, but in 1910, there was something called the Flexner Report, which was a report on the state of medical schools and a, and a kind of a um, uh, initiative to standardize and raise the bar because there were a lot of medical schools that were turning out MDs that didn't really deserve the degree. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of the medical schools that were closed in the wake of the Flexner Report were the women's medical colleges, which were mediocre, the way Elizabeth and Emily had said they were. And a lot of the um, progressive reforms that the Flexner Report recommended were the very things that they had done in their own women's medical college, but it, it meant that the opportunities for women to go to medical school suddenly shrank, mm -hmm. um, just sort of an ironic um, impact. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, it was, it was not done. Women, you know, women were discouraged constantly from daring to want to sit in the med medical school lecture hall with men. So there's, they were so afraid of us. Um, That's right. <laughs> Ethi says, um, your research crossed into the lives of many other incredible women. Did you find yourself wanting to follow their lives as well? Sure, definitely. I mean, you go down all sorts of rabbit holes, Lady Byron and Florence Nightingale and um, Lucy Stone and Antoinette Brown, for sure. Um, it, again, this was a very, very rich thing. Um, a lot of those women have been fairly well written about, though. Um, which was a great gift to me because it was easy to find what I needed to find. I like forgotten stories. Um, when you write a forgotten story, you don't risk crossing wires with all the people who have already written the story. <laughs> I'm always amazed that people are want to write more biographies of Abraham Lincoln. Aren't there enough? Um, so I, although I was fascinated to read about all of those other more famous women, um, I wasn't tempted just because I um, I feel like they've been well 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 documented. Helen says that during your research, what was the most surprising discovery that you made about the Blackwell sisters? Hmm, surprising. I mean, I guess I, I, I would twist that a little bit. I, I, I found myself being most in awe um, at moments where they did things without comment that when you think about it were stunningly difficult. Um, Elizabeth Blackwell lost an eye, had an eye removed and replaced by a glass eye, um, and, and went on to continue to study medicine alone in London as the only woman studying medicine in London. Who does that? You know, even just crossing the Atlantic as a woman alone was something that didn't happen very often. And they did this multiple times. Um, that to me, you know, when you when you really sat back and thought, could I do that? Do I know anybody 
who could do that? And and the answer repeatedly was no. You know, these were these were extraordinary women. Mm -hmm. I guess we don't think about that as much because for us, like getting on a plane is no big deal. Heading to Europe, you know, well, <laughs> there's issues, but like, you know, 200 years ago was completely different in yeah, many ways. That's right. Mm -hmm. Um, right. I'm, I'm curious about the fact that neither Elizabeth or Emily got, were married and I don't think their sisters were either, uh, as None you mentioned. Right. So like, how do you think that affected their ability to become doctors and follow their own dreams? I think they had had this sort of negative example of marriage where their father, who they loved, had, you know, died and really left them in the lurch you know having a having a husband was 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 not a, an asset um they you know they had to spring into action and rescue the family the, the three the three eldest children when he died were women so they became teachers instantly and and really kept the family afloat um and i think that that was a very um painful lesson about agency and independence that you needed to have um the ability to support yourself if the bad thing happened. Um, and I think, you know, they had been educated at a very high level. That was very unusual. So that the idea of, uh, I, I'm, I, I want to work, I want to have a sustaining career, I'm a little bored by teaching. And I know that I have the, the intellectual power to, to do more than that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it was it was a funny, sort of a perfect storm of, of circumstances that and then they had these brothers, who as they came of age, I think had some gratitude toward their sisters for, for rescuing the family and some unusual degree of willingness to support them as they pursued these things that weren't marriage. Mm -hmm. That does sound, I mean, just historically, it sounds like a very unique family. Definitely, definitely. Um, it's one of the things that sort of came across in your book was that Emily, uh, you know, as you said, sort of did whatever Elizabeth said, even though they they differed in their opinions about certain things. Do you think that Elizabeth would have been able to accomplish as much as she did if Emily hadn't come along along behind her? I don't, which is, I mean, that that was sort of the thesis that I was working on, you know, in presenting this book as I did. I, I, I don't know that um, Elizabeth has been written about um, alongside Emily like that before. Um, I, it really was, it really was, was striking to me that, um, that it was Emily who sustained Elizabeth's legacy as the first woman doctor in America. Um, Elizabeth split, and it was Emily who made sure those institutions lasted. Um, and interestingly, you know, Elizabeth's name was always at the top of the masthead of those institutions, um, even though she wasn't there for 40 years at the end. Um, I, I, I think I might, I, I might be the only person who ever stumbled across the Blackwell st story via Emily. I actually met Emily first um, mm. in a book about border crossing 19th century women. Um, and I was intrigued enough to, you know, to want to want to know more. And you can't investigate Emily for more than five minutes without discovering that her sister is Elizabeth. Um, but yes, I, I really do think that that um, Elizabeth Blackwell wouldn't have, you know, ended up on a postage stamp if she hadn't had the the, the support of, of her sister, who was was by all measures a better doctor mm. right i mean they sounds like they sounds like they both had their own skills but that elizabeth was sort of like the idea person and emily was like the do person exactly exactly as a practitioner emily was head and shoulders um beyond where elizabeth was mm. so but she wasn't any more accepted in the medical profession by the men even though she was a better practitioner she came to be. I mean, it's interesting that the, the two sisters died within months of each other in 1910. And there was a memorial gathering at the New York Academy of Medicine with a series of, 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 um, of speakers, um, most of whom had worked with Emily at the college and the infirmary, and few of whom knew Elizabeth very well because Elizabeth had been in England for 40 years. So when you read the eulogies of that day, um, the, the, the warmth um, and the respect for Emily shines through. Everybody was mentored by her. Everybody respected her abilities, both as a practitioner and as an institutional leader, as a dean. Um, Elizabeth was more of an idea. Like they were sort of honoring the idea of Elizabeth, but nobody really knew her. 
Um, so I think Emily really did win respect um, in the in the medical community in New York. Elizabeth was always gunning for something a little bit bigger than that. Elizabeth was was gunning for a kind of recognition that wasn't just um, Dr. Blackwell is a good surgeon. Um, mm -hmm. Elizabeth was looking for legacy. She was thinking about about the impact she was making on the world in a way that Emily was never interested in doing. Mm -hmm. And I found it curious, and we're probably going to end in just a couple minutes, but like I found it curious that you said that they weren't suffragettes. They weren't mm. necessarily, were they, I know their father was an abolitionist. I don't know if they were, and that they didn't really like women that much. Like they, mm. <laughs> they sort of looked down on them. I know that um, Elizabeth was very against like birth control and, you know, anything that like that. So, you know, it's interesting that they became sort of this legend as they have been given that you know, they had this whole other side of them. Feminism is complicated. I mean, I think the reason they end up on the children's shelf and not the adult shelf is that adult biographers pick them up and then say, oh, wait a second, they're not behaving like my, I want my feminist icons to behave. I think maybe I'll pick a different subject. But I think that's sort of the point and, and, and a lot of the interest. They didn't align with the suffrage movement, not because they didn't believe in suffrage, but that they believed it was, they were, that the suffragists were going about it backwards. They, they thought, why make the vote the very first priority of the women's rights movement? If you give women the vote before you teach them that they can think independently, then all they're going to do with a vote is vote the way their men tell them to vote. So what is that? What is that accomplished? Let's help women understand that they can be independent, mm -hmm. and then we can give them the vote, and they'll know what to do with it. So that's an interesting perspective. They also really weren't team players, and they didn't want to be part of a movement. They wanted to um, be examples. Uh, and that's a slightly different orientation. The the misogyny they felt toward other women, I think, is all too familiar. I mean, I, I, I this is all around us today. Accomplished women who aren't particularly helpful to other women because they had to struggle, so you have to struggle. You know, um, that that's all too familiar. Um, I think Elizabeth and Emily would recognize it today. And and I found that again a very humanizing, um, relatable thing in in a story from so long ago. Mm -hmm. I see that Effie's raised her hand, so I'm just going to ask her to unmute and she can ask her question. I, I, as I'm listening to you, I'm getting a sort of a sense here that your admiration for Emily outweighs your admiration for Elizabeth. <laughs> and did you find yourself getting somewhat annoyed that Elizabeth has the fame because she was the first, but Emily was, was really the better of the two? No, I wouldn't say annoyed because what Elizabeth did was harder. I mean, I what 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 she did was 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 start from nothing and nowhere and make this happen. Um, you can't take that away from her. Um, the fact that Emily, I, I mean, I if if you asked me which doctor I would choose to consult, I would have chosen <laughs> Emily. Um, if you'd asked which doctor I wanted to have a cup of coffee with, it might be Emily. Although I don't think either of them were all that much fun over a cup of coffee. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I think. I, 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 I wasn't frustrated with Elizabeth. Um, I was rooting for Emily, though. So you, you, you got that right. <laughs> <laughs> I got that feeling. <laughs> Thank you. Thank for you. sure. Um, so we're about out of time. I do want to say thank you. And um, everybody who's here, feel free to write in the chat what you thought of this program. Um, as I, again, thank Jana so much for this uh, enlightening and interesting conversation, <laughs> because I love the history of bi and biography of women, and I always feel like it's interesting to get different perspectives on it. So I really appreciate your time. And um, again, I want to thank the Friends of the Library and the, Laura from Framingham Public Library, who's here helping out with the uh, program. So thank you, Janice. I hope we have so more books from you in the future. Thanks. I do too. <laughs> and I know you said that you don't have anything in mind yet, but we'll be keeping an eye out. I appreciate it. Thank you all so much for your excellent questions. Yeah. Well, have a wonderful night, everybody. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Good night. Good night.